And good, uh, what is it? Good uh, Thursday to you. We'll silence the music a little bit. Or does it sound motivational to have that music in the background? I don't know. We're glad you're here today uh, as uh, we join together for Ask the Theologian, your biblical, theological, and worldview questions. Always happy to take them. Uh, glad you are with us today again uh, for your biblical theological and worldview questions let's start out right here uh, manny sent me this ahead of time a uh, little uh, meme that he ran across it says beware dispensationalism is flat out wrong well i agree we should beware I think we should beware with Calvinism, dispensationalism, uh, you name your isms. We should beware. Is it flat out wrong? That looks like, speaking of ism, somebody has clearly reduced dispensers sometimes overstate their case. And that's exactly uh, what has happened here. I I, I suppose that whoever is uh, uh, whoever put this out uh, probably is not interested in the conversation on uh, saying, well, let's uh, let's look at some things. Uh, dispensationalism really is a hermeneutic. A hermeneutic is how you interpret scripture. Dispensationalism is reading the Bible literally. So is it flat out wrong to read the Bible literally? Well, I would uh, suppose that if I were able to look the author in the face and say, dispensationalism, a hermeneutic, reading the Bible in its context, uh, taking it literally when the plain sense makes common sense, seek no other sense, uh, in its uh, history, context, uh, grammar, all that, that's flat out wrong? Well, no, not that. Oh, you mean then this other thing you think is flat out wrong. And that other thing is not dispensationalism. So I, uh, I think, and all of us do this again when we argue, we uh, kind of uh, present this straw man that says, avoid whatever it is. Uh, and usually we need to be a little more specific in that. Now, dispensationalism is flat out wrong. Now, here's what they really mean. Uh, they mean, as it goes on, instead of teaching that God has allowed the Gentiles to be partakers of the covenants and promises given to Israel, dispensationalism teaches that we have nothing to do with Israel. This is completely opposite of what the Apostle Paul teaches. Now, I don't know if in a meme, you know, it uh, can't uh, include everything. It's kind of like a billboard. I don't know if they went on to show, you know, this is what the Apostle Paul teaches, that the covenants are now ours. Uh, uh, but I can tell you that if uh, you make the covenants ours, then God really pulled a fast one on Abraham, didn't he? Uh, and on those Jewish people. <laughs> they thought they were the chosen people. Ha! God tricked them. He snookered them good. They did all that law abiding because God had given them these promises. And if you do this, I will do that. But what he really meant is if you do this, I'll pull those things right out from under you and I'll give them to your enemies. Ha 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 I am a sovereign God. Pardon me. Sometimes I get a little animated. But that's, in effect, what that is. So, dispensationalism teaches that we have nothing to do with Israel. Well, that wouldn't be the best way to put that. With Israel, um, I go to Israel every year. I'd be happy to take you this December. Hope we can go. Uh, and uh, some of you are signed up. We'll look forward to it. But d dispensationalism does teach that the church is not Israel, and Israel is not the church. Now, whoever put this out, uh, you know, Gentiles are partakers of the covenants and promises given to, why did they say that? The covenants and promises given to, does that say Israel? The covenants and promises given to Israel, to get, 
but now the Christians or the church is going to get it too. Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, probably uh, if you look to Ephesians chapter 3, you uh, see this uh, mystery, the knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known. It's now revealed, was revealed unto Paul. That's what he said uh, in uh, verses 1 and 2, is revealed his holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit, not the dead prophets, by the way, like Isaiah and Ezekiel, but the prophets of that particular day. They were living in a prophetic day. It's been revealed to the apostles and to uh, the prophets, like Agabus. Remember him? Prophet living in that day. It's been revealed to the holy apostles and uh, the prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of of, of the covenants and promises given to Israel. Oh, there it is. The church is fellow heirs and uh, of the same body partakers of the covenants and promises to Israel, just like it says, uh, except that it says of his promise in Christ by the gospel whereof I was made a minister. Uh, maybe, maybe there's a problem there, isn't there? Maybe there is uh, this deal of Ephesians chapter 3 does not say we get Abraham's promises, nanny, nanny, boo, boo. It says Jewish people and Gentile people now become fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister. The gospel that Paul was a minister was neither Jew nor Gentile. It was not of the old covenant, that's what uh, Peter was made a minister of. It's not of the new covenant. That's what Peter was given to uh, be a minister of. And what we have here is that Paul was made a minister of the new body. Now, uh, Manny uh, had asked a question the other day that I hadn't gotten to as well about this uh, new body. What is this new body? Uh, and uh, let me see if I have that uh, question here. Uh, make sure I get that uh, right. Uh, there we go. Uh, the one new man. Uh, is the one new man in Ephesians 2.15 the same as the body of Christ? Uh, I think it is. Let's uh, look at Ephesians 2.15. And I think that's what we have here in Ephesians uh, 3, verse uh, 6, also of this same body, Ephesians 2.15, having, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for indeed to make himself of twain, the Jews and the Gentiles, one that new man is this new thing of which Jews and Gentiles are partakers of. It's not Israel, it's something new. So, the meme is flat out wrong. But this is what memes do. Uh, I used to call it Twitter theology. I think before that, uh, some people called it bumper sticker theology. You know, it's really good until you actually consider it and look at the details. And I think when uh, you look at those details, that uh, that's the uh, challenges and the problems uh, that you have there. I have uh, noticed a, a couple of uh, comments coming through about uh, perhaps some uh, buffering going on, some uh, issues taking place. I am uh, going to uh, yak a little bit uh, while you all tell me if, all, if that's happening everywhere. Uh, like uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube, tell me what's going on. Because I am flying solo today. Nathan uh, 
had a contractor come into his house that could only do it at 10 a.m. Can you believe that? What's up with contractors not watching Ask the Theologian? I don't get it. I absolutely don't get it. Seems to me like the world ought to take a moment of silence at 10 a.m. Mountain Time uh, every day of the week to watch Ask the Theologian. Our special uh, this week is uh, Ever Reforming by Dr. Andy Woods, Dispensational Theology and the Completion of the Protestant Reformation. I think it's $13.59 or so. Uh, that's 30% off, regular $19.95. Uh, happy to get that uh, in the mail to you today. Our newest book, Understanding the Psalms, Five Books of Prophecy by James C. Morris, uh, is uh, really kind of a a good intro to understanding the Psalms as prophecies and understanding the five books of the Psalms. As you know, I am uh, going to be uh, uh, working on uh, this in our Branson uh, broadcast and uh, carrying that out, uh, our, our Branson broadcast, our Branson retreat, I should say, and uh, looking forward to uh, that and uh, carrying that out. So, we will be uh, doing that. Uh, sorry for those of you on Facebook who just came into the broadcast. Uh, uh, that's because uh, you didn't pay your Facebook bill. That's what it was. It was Mark Zuckerberg holding us, holding us, wouldn't let us start on time. That and I forgot to push the button. That's what happens when I fly uh, solo. So, uh, uh, but uh, let's uh, see here. Okay, it looks like uh, things are uh, just... Uh, uh, having a problem for some people, but uh, working great for others. Uh, so uh, sorry about that. Uh, you might switch over to Facebook, which uh, I have clicked the button now. If uh, you're having bu buffering problems, maybe that'll help you. Facebook.com slash Pastor Randy White. And uh, those of you on Facebook who missed uh, the discussion of the meme, you can go to YouTube and catch that out. Beware, dispensationalism is flat out wrong. That's right. It's flat out wrong. Now, we're ready for your biblical, theological, and worldview uh, questions, and uh, we will uh, see uh, what uh, we've got uh, through all that. Again, sorry that some of you may be having some buffering uh, problems uh, there, and uh, hopefully the recording. It'll be good afterwards if you're uh, missing all this. We'll just uh, keep going here. So, uh, Renee has a question. In heaven, will be will we be living in literal houses? My life will my life resemble anything like on Earth as families living together? Uh, I don't think we have the answer to it. I think that we know more about the millennium for the Jewish nation. That's the kingdom on Earth, but we don't really know what the new body, the body of Christ, is going to be doing in that time. Um, we, but we know more about the millennium than we do eternity future, the new heaven and the new earth. So uh, I don't think the question is answered. You know, typically teachers would go from John 14, in my father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. And uh, they pick a good country gospel song, you know, there's, just, there's a mansion just over the hilltop, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And they'll put those two things together and build their theology. I don't really think John 14 is about whether or not I'm going to live in a mansion or in a house or in a condo uh, near the mountains or no mountains or uh, uh, on the beach or whatever. I, I just don't think we know. Eternity future uh, involves the new heaven and the new earth. We know so little about it. Uh, I think that we could take the passage that Paul writes, is it in 1 Corinthians? Uh, uh, where he says, I hath not seen nor ear heard the things uh, prepared for those who love him. Pardon, pardon the paraphrase there. And say that Paul is convinced that it's absolutely wonderful. He doesn't tell us a whole lot about it. I think there's Again, that we, now we see through a glass darkly, but I think there's enough evidence that on the other side we do know each other. And uh, therefore, I would assume that we would have uh, family relationships uh, and that uh, uh, there would be the blessing of those we have known in the past and walked with together as a past. But honestly, it is a lot of speculation when it comes to heaven. Now, I know that you can... Uh, you can find books that tell you all the answers. 
but you can't find in the Bible where all the answers are. I personally am comfortable saying, as Dan uh, mentions, that uh, we will forever be with the Lord. Uh, absent from the body, together with the Lord, or raised up to uh, meet the Lord in the air, and forever we will, we will be with him. And that that is good enough. The details, he's going to work them out. And everything is going to be fine, and everything's going to be wonderful. You know, every now and then, uh, well, for example, even on our trips to Israel, uh, there are some people who love to know every detail about where we're going to be every day and what we're going to do at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and all those kind of things, and happy to provide for them. I notice there's others that uh, say, hey, I'm going on this wonderful trip. Wherever you take me, that's going to be a good place. I'll just, uh, you know, I'll t- tell me when to get on the bus, and I'm on the bus. Now, I, I'm a little more, when it comes to heaven, I'm a little more on that side of things that says, Rather than speculate, let me just uh, know that it's going to be, life in heaven is going to be absolutely beyond compare and beyond what we could even imagine, and I'm comfortable leaving the details up to him and uh, leaving it that way. Wish I could give, uh, you know, a great uh, answer uh, in uh, that, but uh, uh, honestly, I don't think that uh, the answer is there. Let's go to Jeff's question. Uh, Is it possible that uh, Job chapter 30 verses 1 through 8 is describing Neanderthals or cavemen? Uh, First of all, let me me do a um, uh, quick educational journey uh, to Wikipedia. Uh, in order in order to say no with a, w- with a huge disclaimer up front. but uh, you use the word Neanderthal and of course you do uh, uh, tie that in with cavemen. but let's look at the Neanderthal. Uh, Homo neanderthalis, uh, Homo sapiens neanderthalis, are an extinct species or subspecies of archaic humans who lived in Eurasia until about 40,000 years ago. By interpretation, that means we made stuff up about a missing link. Uh, So... So I want to I want to remove the word Neanderthal because I think in its uh, most most uh, characteristic I think Jeff would agree with me on this one in its most characteristic use uh, when you Google it Neanderthal is a creature that never existed in a time that never existed uh, you know a, a missing link forty thousand years ago now extinct uh, now cavemen uh, were there cavemen. I think in some places there were. Obviously, you come, uh, you know, uh, you can come up here to the Taos Prophecy Conference uh, if you'd like, and uh, September 25 through the 27th, and on the 26th on Saturday, you'll have Saturday afternoon off, and you could drive uh, down to the Puye Cliff Dwellings or the Bandelier Cliff Dwellings if you'd like, or uh, you wouldn't really have time to make it up to Mesa Verde and back uh, in time. But you know, all through the American West, uh, there's uh, cliff dwellings. If you want to call those cave, cave dwellings, I, I think that when you really look into there, they were pretty sophisticated in what they did. Uh, but yeah, there were, there were men and women who lived there made in the image of God, not Neanderthal kind of people, and uh, people who you know lived in caves uh, down through the ages. If you didn't have much money, a cave was a pretty good place to live. And uh, so, uh, so they did that. I think that Uh, Caveman existence has been very rare all through human history. Uh, Very few times when, in fact, probably never when society as a whole had a caveman kind of existence. Again, you go right down the road here to the Puyé Cliff Dwellings or the Bandelier Cliff Dwellings, uh, and you see their their houses... um, that were uh, built in, 
in the caves here. Uh, let's see if I can just, um, I don't know, pull up a, a decent uh, image uh, that would um, show. Uh, yeah, let's try this one. Um, and uh, so you take, uh, you know, cliff, cliff dwellings such as this. Well, you can see, okay, they, they're, they're in a cliff or in a cave, if you will. They're, they're clearly man-made uh, in, in rock that would uh, support it, uh, you know, but, you know, that's not a natural cave there. That's dug out of there. Um, and it's in a porous rock that would have, uh, you know, opened up into a lot of uh, cave openings. And uh, you can see that there's some holes in the rocks here where probably they put logs out there and built uh, structures outside of the cave. There was some reason that they chose to dwell there in that cave. Maybe it was uh, an enemy, and normally they would have built out on the, on the plains of the prairie. Uh, maybe it's because inside of the rock it's cool, uh, cool in the, win in the summer and warm in the winter. Did I get that right? Yeah. And so, you know, it was good, uh, good climate control uh, to uh, live in, and so they chose that. Uh, but that's pretty rare down through history. And again, they had a reason and a pretty high-tech reason for doing this. This uh, protects us from the enemy or this protects us from the elements. Uh, this, we've already got three walls already done. Hey, good deal. And so uh, they, uh, they began to uh, do that thing. Of course, Mesa Verde, uh, much more uh, advanced even than that. Now, uh, so with that, I'm going to set aside the idea of Neanderthal. Neanderthal, but maybe it's talking about people who are living, I even hate to say primitively, because some of those are pretty nice caves. With a, that It may have been, down the road at Bandelier, that the, the upper echelon of society was what got to live in the cave dwellings. It's the poor man who lived out in the open in his, uh, you know, little shack that he built from a few, few pinon trees. And, uh, you know, the elite of society lived up, to use the Hebrew word, in the elite. Did you know the Hebrew word elite is the heights? Lived up there in the heights, you know, where the rich people live. So we might have a very bad anthropological understanding of cavemen. But let's look at Job chapter 30, verses 1 through 8, and uh, see if it is possible that this is talking about something along those lines. But now they are younger than I, they that are younger than I, have, uh, have me in derision, whose fathers I would have disdained to have set the dogs of my flock. Yea, whereto might the strength of their hands profit me, in whom old age was perished. For want of famine they were solitary, fleeing into the wilderness, in former time desolate and waste, who cut up mallows by the bushes, and juniper roots for their meat. They were driven far north from among men. They cried after them as a thief to dwell in the cliffs of the valleys, in the caves of the earth, and in the rocks. Among the bushes they brayed, among the nettles they were gathered together. They were children of fools, yea, children of base men. They were viler than the earth. Okay, now, let me tie that in with uh, what I said. Uh, that says there were people who were out just living in the land, living on, you know, d dwelling in a cave, whatever they could get by with. But what I want you to notice is Job... Uh, says, you know, th those are the people I would have disdained. I would have disdained to have sat with the dogs of my flock. Now, that is to say, that's a very unusual portion of society. Uh, that is people that have chosen by some very bad decision making to live in such a way when they could live in a much better way. Nathan and I talk, uh, you know, quite often when we'll see, especially someone homeless who looks like they could get a job uh, and they're standing around 12 places with help wanted signs. 
And, uh, you know, a, uh, a good shower and a cleanup, uh, even down at the homeless shelter, and they could probably go and uh, get one of those jobs. And yet they don't. Uh, and he and I have commented several times, uh, you know, I would rather work at Taco Bell, uh, you know, making those delicious tacos than standing on the street corner day after day after day after day after day begging for some money. I mean, you know, give me a little $10 an hour job. I'll go for that. That sounds at least more interesting. Get some interaction or something than, than not doing anything. But there are people who choose to not do anything. Uh, and uh, maybe this is kind of what uh, Job is talking about, that segment of society that is so, uh, uh, I'm not sure what the word I want to use, uh, so rebellious that they're not going to have a part in society. So they move off there. Now, this is not so they can spend time with God. Uh, this is uh, probably because there are thieves and crooks and can't live in town because they'd be arrested. Uh, that it's talking about here. Now, uh, with with that, you know, could could you say, hey, he's referring to the caveman population? In a sense, yes. And, and again, clearly, there's enough anthropological evidence to say, yeah, there were cavemen. Bandelier, Pouillet, Mesa Verde, there were cavemen. And go anywhere in the world, there were cavemen. I'm not so sure there aren't cavemen today, actually. As a matter of fact, I can take you to a tree in town. It's a cedar, you know, it's a, a cedar's like a big bush, so the leaves are all the way down. And uh, we could drive by that and I'd say, you know, see that tree over there? Yeah, beautiful tree. I say, it's somebody's house. Look closely. And if you look very, very, very closely, you see there's a tent inside of there. I mean, up underneath there, t t there's a guy living in there. So always there has, uh, has, has been that. And it's in, I suppose, everywhere you go, I see uh, that, um, yeah, Greg says, uh, uh, Frijoles Canyon. I used to live 14 miles from there. Yeah, uh, uh, I thought you were talking about North Carolina. It turns out he's talking about New Mexico. Why would you leave the land of enchantment? Uh, that's a story for another day. But uh, I think you could go anywhere and find that there always have been and are today people who are living that kind of life. You know, there's no taxes, there's nobody bothering you, there's nobody, uh, whatever. I mean, I, I, I don't want that kind of life. But there are people choosing to live that kind of life. Uh, and by the way, let me say to this also, I'm kind of getting away from the scripture here, aren't I? But uh, that's, uh, that's what we do here on Ask the Theologian, is we wander around a little bit. I can respect to a degree a person who says... I'm just not cut out for the rat race of this world. I am going to, you know, go to the national forest and wander around and get me a tent and I'm going to live in it and, uh, and, you know, I'm just going to, you know, live free or die. I can respect that if they actually do that. But if they come to town asking me to pay their bills or you to pay their bills, I cannot respect it at all. Because they're not saying, I've just chosen to live free from society. They're saying, I've chosen to mooch off you. I want, uh, I, I want unemployment assistance. I want uh, you know, uh, disability assistance. I want cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. I want to show up on Sunday morning and ask your people at your church for some money because they're rich white folk. And uh, on and I can't respect that at all. And uh, I don't think we're even supposed to be sympathetic to that, even though the left and most uh, evangelicals say, no, 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 they're just down on their luck. Uh, I, I think people who have that opinion are, you know, sort of down on their thinking ability. You know, they're not just down on their luck. They have made a choice to mooch off society. And I don't think I have to go along with that choice. 
Now, again, if they want to make that choice, I'm good with it. It's not the choice I'm going to make, but I'm good with it. You want to go uh, live out there? You know, there's a lot of public land out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think you can, you can live there 14 days. You've got to move around every 14 days, I think, is the uh, regulation. And, uh, you know, you go out there and set up a tent somewhere. Fine. Do it. But eat berries or something or, you know, uh, shoot a chipmunk or whatever it is that you're going to do to feed yourself. You've got to have a plan. Man has to be responsible. Now, I think that Job, in a sense, is talking about that population. You know, their fathers I would have disdained to have set with the dogs of my flock. Yea, whereto might the strength of their hands profit me, in whom old age perish. Now, uh, let me pull up my notes here on this particular uh, chapter, and uh, let's see what I had to say about um, verses 1 through 8, uh, the description of Job's enemies. The tables have turned, and Job, the old man, is being mocked and mistreated by young men whose fathers I would have disdained to set with the dogs of my flock. Speaking of their fathers, Job says that they would have been of no use to him even in the days of their strength. These men were solitary, is the uh, word that uh, is used in verse 3. Uh, Young's literal says gloomy. Uh, they were solitary because of want and famine. And at the time of Job's strength, they were desolate and waste. The fathers were children of fools, yea, children of base men and viler than the earth. It seems that Job is not talking about his three friends when he refers to those younger than I, but rather to some other party that was now giving him grief. Who might these men be? For Job's particular story, we do not know. For Job's prophetic story, we can speculate the Arab nations are going to be decimated by the Ezekiel 38-39 war. During this time, Babylon will be rebuilt as a cosmopolitan and wicked city. Uh, I shouldn't skip over that. See Future Babylon by Charles Dyer, published by Dispensational Publishing House. Daniel 11 tells how the Antichrist will rule over the Arab peoples, but these peoples shall trouble him. Could it be that the Arab peoples will be of no strength during the days of Jewish prosperity, but then will rise in strength and be the same group of people who give derision to the Jewish people represented by Job? Now, if you were part of our Job study, you know that I take Job to be a type of prophetic Israel under the tribulation. And so here, uh, tie that together and it would uh, come to, uh, to perhaps represent them. Now, in Job's actual day, who did they uh, represent? Uh, certainly some kind of uh, enemy who was living a caveman kind of existence but I think the caveman kind of existence is always an anomaly and always present. Uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, that's uh, what I'd go with. Thank you for the good question uh, in uh, that. Um, and uh, let's see here. What have we got uh, next? Um, uh, Stephen, oh, you and I must be brothers. Stephen says, I am always precise and never exaggerate and am always uh, uh, using satire, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Always precise. I never exaggerate. I never overstate my case. Yes, exactly. Something like that, right? Uh, something like that, indeed. Um, uh, let's see. Um, ah, Carol says there are still people living in caves in Morocco. Hot peppermint tea there with their family. Yeah, you know, uh, there can be, again, like, I think, like, probably those, uh, even as I mentioned a bandolier, I think... They might have been the elite, and there, there's, there's might be a, it just might make a decent house, um, in 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 uh, some uh, some manner. Phil in Nashville, south of Nashville. Good to see you. 
Uh, been struggling with eschatology lately, specifically the dispensational view of the pre-trib, pre-mill. How do we know that Nero wasn't the beast of Revelation? He was even nicknamed the beast. Okay, uh, I think to uh, take a look at that, what we would uh, want to look at is uh, the things of the beast, that is the uh, description of the beast, and we want to know does Nero uh, fit the criteria? And so we would look at it, and uh, here in Revelation chapter 3, I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Uh, now, I'm just going to go from Revelation 13. We could go from some other passages. So the beast as you get the total picture through, mainly through Daniel and Revelate in the book of Revelation, but there are some other passages too. But mainly when you go from Daniel and Revelation, you put some things together that uh, tell you about the beast. Uh, like uh, he rises from nothingness uh, to control uh, first three kingdoms and then Ten kingdoms all together. Uh, so, Nero, Claudius, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus. Uh, there we go. Uh, December 37 uh, through uh, 68 AD. Okay. Emperor from 54 to 68. Uh, so, in, uh, clearly, you're going to have to build the argument that the book of Revelation was, was uh, written prior to... Uh, Early, pretty early on before 68, because, you know, here's uh, talking about the rise of uh, this uh, beast here. If it was written, you know, uh, more traditional dating of uh, 95 AD, then Nero is already passed. So it's just, you just well say it's Antiochus Epiphanes who probably fits it better than Nero. It's a, that's a dead guy and he's talking about the future. So you have to have a very solid argument to put Revelation early. Now, there are some arguments out there uh, that you could work on to do that, but that's one criteria is you would have to have that. Uh, so he was the last ruler of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, born Lucius Domitius, that guy, son of another guy, and Agrippa the Younger, sister of Emperor, uh, or excuse me, uh, his, his mother was the sister of Emperor Caligula. His uh, dad died in 40. His uncle was murdered in 41. His great uncle Claudius. What I'm saying is, if there was ever a guy with white privilege, it was Nero. Uh, the Antichrist, as you take him, this is a little more from Daniel, but as you take him, he's this guy that comes a little horn, comes sort of out of nothing. Uh, you could... You, you know, you could stretch the truth on some things and try to make that fit to Nero, but I don't know that it does. Then you've got to put ten horns, uh, uh, crowns upon his head, the name of blasphemy, uh, the beast which I saw was like a leopard, the foot of a feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion, uh, the dragon gave him power in his seat and authority. Somehow, how does that fit Nero? I don't know. Make stuff up. You know, he had uh, he had leopard eyes. Ooh, Nero had, look at those leopard eyes and that hair like a lion. See, you just have to start making stuff up to say, uh, this is uh, Nero. Uh, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. How does it fit Nero? I don't know, unless again you make something up, uh, then it uh, fits Nero. Uh, they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast. Okay, uh, did Nero get his power from Satan? Because clearly in chapter 12, the dragon is Satan. And they were worshipping Satan and worshipping Nero, uh, saying, who is like the beast and able to make war with him? Uh, I don't know uh, Nero's uh, war, war uh, experiences. We'd have to look at that and uh, see if there's uh, some connection. Uh, there was always some Caesar worship. Uh, you know, how prevalent was that to be able to make that uh, connection there? 
There was given to him a mouth speaking great blasphemies. Again, Antiochus Epiphanes spoke greater blasphemies. Nero is penny ante compared to Antiochus Epiphanes. You know, Antiochus Epiphanes is the giant. And Nero is a little, little, tiny boy compared to Antiochus Epiphanes. So if it's already in the past, go with Antiochus Epiphanes. It's a, it's, he fits it better. Uh, and uh, let's see, power was given to him for 42 months. You have to say 42 months doesn't mean 42 months. And then you have to say, and I'm the expert on what 42 months means. Just ask me. And well, a, a dispensationalism says 42 months is 42 months. He didn't have a 42-month reign. Uh, 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 let's see. Um, it was given to him to make war with the uh, saints and, <clears throat> and overcome them. Again, there's been a lot of people that fit down through history. Uh, Adolf Hitler, for example. Um, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Well, it's a far, 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 you got to be in a drunken stupor kind of stretch to say that everybody on earth worshipped him, whose names were not written in the book. Uh, uh, and uh, this another beast, who's, who's the other beast that exercises the power of Nero and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship Nero? whose deadly wound was healed. Oh, for th th that stuff's just, it's just fluff. It's just there for, uh, uh, you know, artistic rendering. Because this is about Nero. I know it is because I reject taking the scripture literally. Again, you just got to make so much stuff up that, yeah, you got to be in a drunken stupor to believe that that describes Nero. It's the same, I mean, let's talk about dispensationalists. Premillennial dispensationalists often take the seven churches of the Revelation and they say, you know, this is this period of church history and that period and that period because they pick one or two things that go together. But you remember my favorite uh, illustration is that things that are similar are not the same. Is there any similarity between Nero and the coming beast? Yeah, Nero is a vicious beast. Therefore, it's Nero. Well, Antiochus Epiphanes was a vicious beast who made war with the saints. Again, Antiochus Epiphanes fits it better than Nero. Nero is the junior high kid compared to Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, so things that are similar are not the same. I just, I don't see, which mode should we highlight? There we go. Question the assumptions. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't see that there is enough uh, to go in so he exercises the power. To, who's this uh, false uh, uh, beast? Uh, let's see. He doth great wonders and maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. I don't know if Nero ever did that. He burned some people at the stake, didn't he? Um, he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had the power to do. This is uh, speaking of the, uh, the, the, the servant of Nero, uh, saying to them that dwell upon the earth that they should make an image of the beast which had the wound. So how did the, you know, where's this image? Uh, and the image, not just, yeah, they made a statue of Nero, therefore it's him. There's the statue right there. Well, Let's keep reading because he had the power to give life into the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the beast should be killed. Uh, that is a very dead statue. Was there another one that came alive? We just forgot it down through history? It's easy to forget statues that come alive. I, I realize that. You know, it happens all the time, right? No, it's a, it's a far stretch, as they say south of Nashville, right? It's a far piece to uh, make Nero fit the description other than a few uh, similarities. It causes all those uh, 
small, great, rich, poor, free, to receive a mark in their right hand or their foreheads that no man may buy or sell, save he that had the mark. Did Nero have a, you know, a, a, this a kind of mark that uh, goes together? Uh, I, I, I think it's just way too much of a stretch uh, to go with, with that. And I think that's going to be true about any historical figure that uh, you find and put, uh, put in there. Uh, and just as trying to make those seven churches of the Revelation fit down through seven periods, uh, I'm an expert on it. I did a six-hour Bible study on it once. Um, but in the end, when you press the details, you end up having to reject it. And I think what you end up having to do is say, this is talking about something future. N not only do you have to say, here's the characteristics of the beast, and every one of them have to line up with Nero, Antiochus Epiphanes, Hitler, whoever I want to choose, but then you've got to put the chronology of all the other things going together, and you've got to uh, have something uh, on all of that, and uh, you've got to have the beast come to his uh, end, Zechariah describes how he comes to an end. Uh, Daniel speaks of it a little bit. The book of Revelation speaks of it a little bit. You've got to have the fall of Babylon. You've got to have the second coming. All of these things also have to have taken place back then. Uh, somehow, maybe in the destruction of Jerusalem, which Nero was already dead by then. I don't know how you put it all together. Uh, I think there are some who just work a little too too hard not to take the scripture just in its plain uh, sense of what it, uh, what it, what it means. Uh, so I would say uh, that I'm not, I, I'm not convinced. Um, thank you uh, for the question there, Phil. Good to see you. I appreciate uh, that. And um uh, Good to see our friend Paul in the Ukraine. Thanks for your ministry uh, over there and uh, what uh, you are carrying out, the good work uh, that uh, you did. I, uh, I liked your video this morning, Paul, by the way. Although I think you should have included the dispensational publishing church finder, uh, as, uh, as number one, and then your number two and three, I totally agree with. Uh, but I don't have time to go into all of that. Uh, I gotta get back to the questions here. Uh, again, thanks uh, each of you for joining us. Um, and uh, let's uh, see here, where am I? A uh, question from San Antonio. Uh, the trespasses in 2 Corinthians 5.19 and Colossians 2.13, is this talking about the sins that we did as unbelievers, or is this talking about us being sinners because of Adam? Or, may I add, or is it talking about neither, none of the above? <laughs> let's, uh, let's check. I think I know the context of these, but uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses. Let's look at something here. Uh, the world is singular, and there is plural. Um, not imputing their trespasses, that would be uh, mean, there's a little rule of putting the plurals and the singulars together on this, but uh, what that would mean is that uh, this is for anybody who lives in the world, but it's on an individual basis. Um, not imputing the individual trespasses unto them and have committed unto us the the uh, the word, singular, of reconciliation. Now, in that light then, the question, uh, is this talking about the sins that we did as unbelievers or is it talking about us being sinners because of Adam? I've, I'm going to put both, both uh, but 
I am going to to say I really think it's talking about our individual sins. Uh, But one of our trespasses is we were born in the wrong family. Uh, That is Adam's family. And this has to be overcome. Now, in a sense, what this verse is saying is, the Lord says, I am Lord, both of the dead and of the living. And I can offer you a remedy for the family problem you've got, Adam's sin. I can offer you a remedy and restore you back to the Garden of Eden, so to speak. But you all have sins, some of you more than others. And I think I'll hold those against you. I could offer you the ultimate remedy, but I tell you what, I'm going to hold those against you. No, he says, no, that's not what I'm going to do. I am not going to hold those individual sins against you in offering to you a gift which by grace, through faith, not of works, a free will gift offered unto you, you can accept it or reject it, regardless of what your personal individual sins are. So I think there that the thrust of the matter is individual sins, uh, but the gift is overcoming the Adam sin, if you will. So in the very context right here, again, I think uh, the uh, issue is individual sins. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And you, being dead, you is the uh, plural, uh, y'all, being uh, dead is uh, in the plural, in your sins, plural. Uh, You, when the plural goes with the plural, as you have here, uh, we're talking about individuals. You, those who are in the category of being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He hath quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. I think here you've got a little bit of both. I think being dead in your, let's just stop right there. Being dead uh, has to do with being a child of Adam. We are born dead, so to speak. Uh, We are separated from him. Uh, But... He's forgiven you all your trespasses, plural. Uh, I think there, again, is talking about the individual thing. So I think when when you put both of these together, I'm not sure that I have uh, said it this way or thought of it this way, but when you put both of those uh, two passages together and you think of the uh, implications, I think uh, going back it is, hey, you've got this family problem of you're in the world and you're not in heaven, or you're, you're, you're in the world, you're not in the Garden of Eden. Uh, you are in the world, and therefore you're dead in your in your uh, sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Whatever you're, you're the dead. That's your problem, and I can remedy that problem. And I'm in, in remedying that problem. I am not going to hold your individual particular sins against you. You're a cheat. You're a gossip. You're a drunk. You're you know whatever. Uh, I'm not going to hold those against you. I am providing a gift for any in the world to come and receive uh, that gift. So I think on both of these, you've got a little bit of both uh, that uh, uh, comes together here. Uh, Let's see. Um, Blue Letter Bible app now has Don Stewart asking questions. Does he rightly divide? Uh, I am going to do a quick search, but I'm going to have to tell you uh, that I don't know who Don Stewart is. Uh, Let me uh, say something in general, and then let's see if we can uh, find 
the find out a little information here. Blue Letter Bible uh, is a um, uh, a very useful tool. Uh, it is every man's Bible study tool. That is, you can get it, you can get it free, you can get it right now. If you've got internet, you can go to Blue Letter Bible. Like anything the, of value, it takes a little bit of time to learn how to use it. But once you learn it, it's going to provide uh, just really about everything that I provide uh, or that I get through Logos. Um, and uh, it just, uh, uh, I like having something that I can take with me and keep all my notes and all that kind of stuff. So Logos serves uh, better for that. But uh, Don Stewart... Uh, let's hear, I just pulled up this article, um, and, uh, well, let me, let me back up again. Blue Letter Bible tends to be conservative, um, and so I would suspect that Don Stewart at least tries to take the Bible literally, whether or not he has come to the point of rightly dividing it. Uh, I might be a little surprised if he's actually rightly dividing, but who knows? Uh, so let's uh, look a little bit uh, earlier here. So something about divine inspiration. Let's just see quickly what he says. It's both a divine and a human book. I think I agree with him there. It's a unique book. Yeah, I agree with him there. Uh, the process of writing scripture was living, not mechanical. Divine inspiration occurred using the writer's personality and vocabulary. The writers were not merely passive stenographers recording what was dictated to them by God. Exactly how this process occurred is a mystery that God does not reveal. I, I kind of sort of agree with him there. There are many cases in which uh, the prophets especially... Uh, like we've been studying Ezekiel, this is Thursday, we'll do it tonight, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, and, uh, you know, often Ezekiel has said, write this, in which case you've got it. But in general, it doesn't seem to be that, but we also believe that every word is God-breathed. And therefore, again, a little bit of a mystery how that uh, took problem, living, not mechanical. I'm not opposed to that. Scripture is fully authoritative, not partial. Uh, divine inspiration covers every part of the Bible. There are not some parts that are more divinely inspired than others. Neither are there divinely uninspired parts of Scripture. The Bible does not contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. It's a good statement that he's got there. God's authority concerns the wording of Scripture, not merely the context. Uh, that's a verbal plenary inspiration uh, concept, and I would uh, very much agree with that and say uh, that that is... A, uh, a, a, a good concept uh, that he's uh, got there. So, yeah, I'm with him so far. The writing of Scripture was unique. It is not the same thing as illumination. Scripture makes a distinction between God filling a person and his Holy Spirit to supernaturally write divine uh, authoritative Scripture and illumination, the ability to understand the things that are already written. Uh, I'd like for him to go a little farther here. Uh, because I could see what he believes about the Holy Spirit here. The fact that he doesn't go farther maybe tells me he's in a, a good position. I happen to think that uh, illumination does not take some kind of a mystical approach that, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit opens up your brain and puts in the insight. I think illumination comes when we uh, take the Bible literally, we connect the dots, we rightly divide, boo! The light comes on. Illumination. Um, and, and the fact that he doesn't give a mystical approach here, that, that tells me the first uh, impression of Don Stewart is, yeah, okay, uh, kind of like what I uh, see there. Uh, written over 20 books on the subject of evidence for the Christian faith. That could be very good. I am not a big apologetics fan because I think it starts in the wrong place. I think that uh, we ought to focus on verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, and apologetics starts on a defense level, and it can, especially if you're a college student and you know you go to one of these Bible colleges, I'm going to get a degree in apologetics. Uh, well, it's because you like to debate, you like to argue, all those kind of things, you want to defend the faith, all that's good. But you can sure make a mess 
with these apologetic philosophical kind of uh, arguments and th even theological kind of arguments. Whereas if you just learn verse by verse Bible study, you will become the very best apologist that is defender of the faith that there is. So I, you know, evidence for the Christian faith, I don't know what the direction those go, but I, that would raise a tiny little red flag. Uh, the basic Bible study series, okay, that sounds good. Uh, you be the judge, 10 reasons to trust the Bible, the coming temple. Uh, I would say that sounds like he's a premillennial dispensationalist, uh, but I don't know. In the last 15 years, he has spoken in over 30 countries, uh, proclaiming the uh, message of the Christian faith, both reasonable, uh, that, that the Christian faith is both reasonable and intelligent. Uh, yeah, educating our world uh, looks like his uh, website here. Um, and uh, let's uh, see here. Do we have a theological uh, statement here somewhere? Um, to, to, to go in Christ. Um, I don't. I don't see that. It would be kind of nice. But, you know, I must admit, even on our website, it's brief. Um, and it might take you about 15 minutes to figure out uh, who the guy is. So, all of that to say, uh, worthy of investigation. And Blue Letter Bible tends to be positive. The one article I read on uh, Don Stewart seems to be positive. I'd put all that together to say a, uh, uh, a cautious yellow light. How's that? Um, and uh, bring that. If you don't have Bible software, by the way, I do recommend uh, Blue Letter Bible. Uh, uh, for years, I used Blue Letter Bible. And again, uh, for my purposes, uh, I, I uh, like having the ability of uh, working offline and uh, carrying it with me to a beautiful spot up in the mountains and uh, keeping all my notes and being able to make the references and all that kind of thing. Uh, but for, for uh, the layman or someone just starting out, Blue Letter Bible is an excellent uh, choice uh, to uh, together. Uh, Bev, uh, let's see, I saw your question uh, here somewhere. Where are we, Bev? Uh, there we go. Uh, Bev in St. Croix County, is that anywhere near what is it, Kennesaw? I haven't, I, I, I have not, I've been preparing so much for the coming retreat that honestly, I don't know what's on Facebook. I haven't watched the Republican Na National Convention. I didn't watch the Democratic National Convention, a bit of it. I have uh, barely watched the news. Uh, I have read the headlines. I haven't answered text messages or emails or phone calls. Sorry about all those of you maybe trying to get me. But I did see something going on in Wisconsin. You didn't start it, did you, Bev? I haven't read enough articles to uh, know about that, uh, but uh, is that anywhere near St. Croix County? And who is St. Croix? I was thinking about that the other day. Obviously, that's uh, French. Um, and uh, I don't know how Croix interprets uh, St. Croix. Um, well, how about that? I looked up to see who St. Croix was, and I found out it's the largest of the Virgin Islands. Okay, I guess I'll have to search further. <laughs> Would you like me to get to the question? Since uh, the future kingdom will be ruled with a rod of iron, should we be more concerned today about uh, misconduct... Uh, and part of that cutoff, uh, pardon me, so uh, I am, I'm, I'm going to answer this two ways because this could be uh, going uh, two ways. Uh, let's say our misconduct. I would say that Christians should be concerned about misconduct for a different reason. 
a little higher reason, if you will. And that is to say, God has given us such an unbelievable opportunity, grace gift, that we really do want to try in every way we can, just as a decent human being, we want to try in every way we can to give praise and honor and glory unto him. And that includes our behavior, our conduct. Uh, That's a little higher motivation than saying, I don't want to get caught or I don't want to get in trouble or someday this is going to come out and, uh, you know, we would be uh, ruled with a rod of iron. I think that uh, there there is that sense. Uh, It's because it's hard to tell what judgment comes to the Christian. We know that there is some judgment that comes to a Christian, but we're also forgiven of our sins and we're complete in Christ. So it's very difficult to put all that together. Uh, But that really is not the motivation we necessarily want uh, anyway. And so uh, we, we, I think, uh, carry that out again in a little bit uh, different way uh, through that. Now, uh, the world... Ought to, you know, I think there's a sense in which the world knows that always, somehow, the world ends up getting ruled with a rod of iron. I think, let's take our society today. Let's take you crazy people up in Wisconsin. (laughs) Except for Bev, of course. Uh... That kind of, let's say the, the rioting and the looting and the shooting and the pillage and all that that's uh, going on in Wisconsin. Uh, everybody, left or right, ought to be concerned about that. Not only because of the rioting and the looting and the pillage and the violence, which is reason in and of itself enough, but because rioting, looting, pillage, and violence always is followed by a heavy hand that's going to put that down. And interestingly, writing, looting, pillage, and violence that's done in the name of freedom from the police ends up with a heavy hand by the police. It has to. This is uh, You take the most leftist governor and mayor and eventually... They're going to say, we can't do it anymore. Mayor of Denver said that. As far as I know, he's a leftist. Uh, we, we can't do it. And so they come down heavier than before. So misconduct in society, we all ought to be concerned about that because we're saying government wields the sword and they're going to come with it someday. Uh, And when they do it, the problem is they always push the limits a little farther and then they never take them back. That's been, you know, since March, I've been uh, concerned about that, that uh, the government is taking more and more territory, more and more ground. uh, And they're not going to give it back from now and forevermore. They'll be in control of the restaurants and who can go to the restaurants and how many can be in there and and, uh, all the, uh, uh, you know, new regulations for restaurants and what they have to do and how they have to... Uh, you know, cover their mouth and uh, uh, and uh, uh, twinkle their toes and whatever else. Uh, all the, the thing, governments all they'll they'll have the restaurant regulation agency now because they got away with it for more than three days, and uh, you know they'll never take it back. Churches, uh, you know, in our church, the uh, uh, Blessed Mother Superior, may her name always be blessed. Uh, is coming out, I think, uh, today. And the rumor is she's going to allow us churches to have 40% in attendance now. May the Lord bless her soul. She's just out for our protection. Oh, the dear woman. Uh, Well, how did I jump over into that? (laughs) I, I think that the world is going to be ruled with a rod of iron. And those who carry the rod love to do it. So even put the kingdom aside. Misconduct 
should be taken care of on a, soci- a, a, a local societal level so that we don't end up in tyranny. Because misconduct always ends up in tyranny. Uh, ask the French, those of you in St. Croix County. Uh, you remember that French Revolution, you know, and it ends up with the, with the, the tyranny. This, this is always where it goes. Uh, you go down through uh, history and uh, you just uh, see it again over and over and over and over again uh, through all that. Okay, I uh, am uh, out of time here. And uh, for those of you who might not be listening today because of uh, all that's going on, but for those of you down on the Louisiana and Texas coast, we're praying for you as uh, the uh, storm, uh, what, now I think has passed by. Again, I've been a little uh, uh, off the radar here a little bit uh, lately, and we'll be for a few more days till I see you all in Branson. Um, But uh, praying for Texas, Louisiana, those uh, down there. Tonight we will be on for our uh, study of the book of Ezekiel. I'm looking forward to that. We get into the 12th chapter and uh, carry that out. And thank you all, like uh, Phil says, uh, trying to have an open mind and an open Bible. That is a good thing to do. Which means we question the assumptions. Which means we say, hey, could it be Nero? And all other sorts of things, and we come to a good answer, and we uh, we uh, let uh, the scripture speak for itself, and uh, it does, and it gives us some clarity along the way, and all that is good. And I look forward to seeing you again uh, tonight at uh, what seven p.m. Mountain Time. It'll be a blessing. And until then, I'm Randy White, and this is Ask the Theologian.